What's up guys? Gun here. Hope this video finds you well. Happy Friday. It's July 24, 2020. The world's still a crazy place, but for one night, things felt a little bit more normal as MLB came back. Yankees with a shortened victory over the Nationals and the Dodgers with an expected victory over the Giants. A little bit of a crazy, hey, welcome back DFS night. Juan Soto, all-star for the Nationals, uh, is uh, scratched, put on the coronavirus IL. He, he popped positive. And then, uh, moments before lock, Clayton Kershaw gets scratched, put on the injured list. Uh, apparently, he hurt himself lifting weights. And then Trevor, uh, not Trevor, Dustin May uh, draws a surprise start. So we got a couple of monkey wrenches uh, already in the first night of action. Give us a taste. Give us a run. So welcome back, MLB. Hopefully you guys had a decent night. I had a great night uh, on uh, both sides. Giraffe Kings particularly, I did pretty well in the tiers contest. And we're hoping to keep that momentum going. I love these these bigger slates. Uh, there's 11 games on this, on this uh, Friday night slate. There are three games in the afternoon. In this video, I will not be talking about those three games uh, just because they're not on the main slate. But if you wanted to... Um, you know, tweet me some questions or something like that later on today. I'll try my best to uh, get back to you guys. Uh, in today's video, we're going to break down all 11 games. We're going to talk about each matchup that I have uh, projected. Uh, it is a, a, a crazy time. So uh, all these pictures that we're going to talk about are subject to change. All these projected lineups that we're going to talk about subject to change. So bear with me if some of this stuff kind of falls through. But we're going to get through this. If you guys like what you hear and you like what you see in that spreadsheet, you guys are more than welcome to come try out Premium Pass at RunDFS.com, but it's through Twitter. I keep I'm, It's so natural to plug RunDFS. If you guys want to be part of the Premium Discord, which looks a little something like this, uh, all kinds of text channels. Uh, by the way, Na NASCAR, they crushed it in NASCAR last night. We had um, Jaleas won 10 and a half grand on freaking NASCAR last night while we were watching some baseball. That was cool. Shout out to them. Uh, but if you guys want to be part of 27... A 24-7 around the clock uh, DFS sports chat and pre-lock voice chats. Uh, then come check us out, man. DM me on disc or Twitter to get set up, and you'll also unlock access to the uh, patented spreadsheets. Uh, Twitter.com slash Gundecker Sports. That's how to get it open. All right, I'm not going to waste any time here. We got 11 games. I'm going to jump right on into it. Uh, Marlins at the Phillies. First game on the docket. We got a 7.05 p.m. Eastern first pitch scheduled, 6.05 Central. And we got Sandy Alcantara against Aaron Nola as our bump battle. Miami's lone all-star last year, Alcantara, posted a 3.88 ERA over 197 and a third innings. In six September starts, he had a 2.59 ERA in 41 and a third innings pitched. And against the Phillies last season, he was 2-1 and one with a 3.86 ERA. Nola, on the other side here, he's the first Phillies pitcher to make three straight opening day starts since Roy Holiday from 2010 to 2012. Over the past three seasons, he has posted a 2.74 ERA in 50 starts at Citizens Bank Park. So at home, not too shabby. And we see that in our uh, metrics here has a uh, 3.67 xFIP with an 28.5% K rate overall. It's got a really good uh, caddy in <clears throat> in JT Romuto. So already, I think he's going to be somebody I'm going to be looking at uh, with the high K rate to both sides of the plate. And this Marlins team is going to be one of those teams that we're going to tempt fate with uh, a few times. In years past, they have been a more scrappy, high contact, low strikeout team. But in this projected lineup, they've added Jonathan VR. He's always been a high strikeout guy. Uh, we've got Jesus Aguilar, former Brewer great. He's going to strike out one in four times against uh, righties. Uh, Garrett Cooper, 28.1% carry rate last season. Isan Diaz, 28.7% carry rate. And Jorge Alfaro, former Philly, a 35.4% K rate. So definitely some built-in strikeout potential in this lineup. So I definitely find Aaron Nola at least uh, a, a serviceable, tempting name to throw in my player pool early on. If we're looking at Vegas totals and Vegas odds here, the Phillies are a minus 188 money line favorite with an implied run total of five runs. So a pretty sizable favorite to maybe project Nola in line for a win. And if he can get us six innings, maybe he gets himself a quality start. Alcatar is not going to be a pitcher on my radar. 
um, even though he was an all-star for the Marlins. Uh, I just don't feel a need to get there, and I don't know that I'm going to see a whole lot of upside in this uh, in his metrics. Matter of fact, he could make Bryce Harper extremely interesting as one of the first uh, bats of the night, just 3900 on FanDuel. He is 5K on DraftKings, but still not one of the most expensive outfielders, right? Off the top of my head, I remember seeing Charlie Blackman at like 5.5K. So Bryce Harper's in an interesting spot here. Uh, last season, Alcantara, just a 15.8% K rate to lefties with a 1.35 home run per nine, uh, almost 11% walk rate, and a near 40% hard contact rate. So those are all the perfect ingredients uh, we'd like to see against a guy like Bryce Harper. And since they've been in the same division last year, I do wonder if they had some previous dates. So let me scroll down to Alcantara, Alcantara, however you say it, and see if the, you know, maybe. Maybe there's a pre-existing history here. Uh, Bryce Harper is 6 for 12. Not a bad sample size. One double and a bunch of singles. So uh, for, for projecting power here, it is a nice spot for Harper to get on the board early in this season with a bomb. And we did see him homer off of uh, former teammate Max Scherzer uh, in uh, pre or spring training preseason scrimmage. So don't mind looking at Bryce Harper for some power. Also, don't hate a guy like Didi Gregorius. If we go check out that pitch report, Alcantara uh, throws fastball slider. And as a uh, Yankee fan, I know Didi crushes the slider. So it could be a fun spot to get Didi on the board early on as well. In this band box, weather-wise, look for mid-80s uh, temperature when it may be a little bit of humidity. I don't know if that humidity is going to turn into rain. Just keep an eye on that. But I do like the lefties early on. And I'm not especially scared of this Marlins bullpen. Uh, we saw just the other day in the Brave scrimmage, guys like Adam Conley, who used to play for the Phillies, uh, took the bump for the Marlins. And, and they gave up like a 7-8 run eighth inning. So definitely a good spot for the Phillies. I think the Phillies, generally speaking, this season will be a fun stack. Uh, McCutcheon, Harper, Real Muto, Jay Bruce, Reese Hoskins, Didi, Segura. I mean, there's really not a weak, weak point in this lineup. And I think you get a lot of upside, uh, especially with a lot of some beef power um, contact numbers here. Hard contact rates over 40% for four of the top five hitters against right-handed pitching. Uh, so a really good starting point for the Phillies lineup. And I, I'm going to be a big fan of them stack-wise, uh, not only today, but going forward. Don't see myself stacking Marlins, and I may not have any Marlins in my player pool. Nola is a guy I respect. Uh, on the short slates, I, I get a little bit cute, take some stands, and, and make some some gambles here. I don't really think I'm going to go crazy with some Marlins bats today. If we had to pick one, maybe a guy like, I was going to say, Gary, maybe Corey Dickerson, something like that. Corey Dickerson's at least interesting, just a 15% K rate. And last season, Nola did give up over a, a one home run per nine to lefties so if he runs into a guy he doesn't strike out like a Corey dickerson maybe just maybe uh dickerson gets lucky here at 4400 on DraftKings, i don't even feel like the risk reward is there for me maybe 2500 on fando i'm a little bit more uh enthralled or, or susceptible to play him but that's uh that's that's the first game philly stack not really there on marlins and you can give me some nola nola will be in the pool moving on to the next game kansas city royals at the Cleveland Indians, Indians, um, a pretty sizable favorite here. Minus 225, implied run total of 5.2. Uh, another kind of 80-degree temperature projected. We got Danny Duffy on the bump taking on uh, Shane Bieber. Bieber was MVP of last year's All-Star game. Uh, and one of the early guys to kind of keep an eye on for the uh, Cy Young Award this season. It's going to be an interesting first matchup, a, a little bit of a... a Either contact or heavy strikeout lineup. If you're looking at the Royals K percentage against righties right off the bat, uh, last season Mondesi 30.8% K rate against righties. Or last two seasons 26.2% K rate from Jorge Soler, 34.4% uh, K rate to righties from a guy like Franchi Cordero, Ryan McBroom almost a 31%. So there is some built-in strikeouts, uh, and a guy like Shane Bieber can certainly go out there and get them. Danny Duffy is going to make his third career opening day start. Uh, 2017 and 2018, uh, as the Royals traveled to Cleveland for this opener, Duffy went seven and six with a 4.34 ERA last season. Did have a solid spring training, striking out nine and six shutout innings. In Saturday's interest squad game, he gave up two runs in four innings, and it'll be up against the youngster Shane Bieber, at 25 years old and 54. Excuse me, 25 years and 54 days old. 
Shane Bieber will be the Tribe's youngest opening day starter since 23-year-old CC Sabathia, who made that start in 2004. In 2019, Bieber owned a 3.28 ERA with 259 strikeouts in 214 and a third innings. He looked really good. The metrics really liked him. A 3.3 xFIP to righties last season, a 3.16 to lefties, and an overall home xFIP of 3.17. Sierra looks really good, 3.36, uh, and his swing and strike rate last season at 14% is a whole lot of what you want. And we also like the fact that he keeps the ball on the ground, 44% clip, and a very low walk rate. So he doesn't waste pitches, and he's going to get out and, and likely get strikeouts. Now, uh, he's one of those pitchers that would make my list without hesitation on just about any slate if it wasn't opening day and I had some maybe pitch count concerns. There's a couple of scenarios that this game uh, kind of plays out, but I think the most likely scenario, if we look at the Vegas odds and the implied run total, is the Indians – Get a lead. They keep the lead. The Royals' bullpen was pretty bad last season. They haven't made any really big improvements. So it's a good chance the Indians get a lead, and they're not struggling much this game. So you wonder if they would overwork Shane Bieber uh, past you know, 80, 90 pitches. And we saw that yesterday. Uh, Cueto and uh, Dustin May didn't even go five. Um, Cole and Scherzer were probably on pace uh, for five and six. Uh, actually, Max only went five, and then uh, Cole, g the game got ran down. Actually, both 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 pitchers got CG because the game rained out. So, but it looked like they were ready to take Max out. So early on, I am concerned about these double digit price pitchers uh, with a potential pitch count not what it was uh, in their heyday last season. Guys that can go 105, 110, 115 pitches. So I do have interest in Bieber. I do think he's a solid bank at a win. Uh, and maybe he can get us, you know, 8 to 12 strikeouts as a range of outcomes. Uh, but I am a little bit worried about that pitch count. And I do worry about if the Indians had a pretty sizable lead, would they go into, um, you know, the, the front end of the bullpen and just kind of eat innings here. So something I'm keeping an eye on. I still think he's worth being in my pool. I would just kind of taper my ownership. So absolutely we'll have Shane Bieber. Now let's talk about the Indians. Indians should be a really, really strong stack uh, on paper, pre-flop, the prices are pretty nice all the way around. I think Francisco Lindor on both sides is going to pique my interest. I, I love him historically against left-handed uh, pitching, a 298 average the last two seasons against lefties. Hits for decent power, a 504 slugging, a pretty decent hard contact rate. And this right here is what you really love to see, very low strikeout rate. So it's going to likely make contact. And Danny Duffy comes into this season um, with a 5.05 xFIP last season to right-handed hitters, and that uh, is continuing his over 5 xFIP against righties from what he had in 2018. And he's a fly ball guy, man. He gives up bombs. A 1.5 home run per nine to righties the last two seasons. And remember, this is a guy that plays in Kauffman Park, a much bigger field than progressive field, a much more pitcher-friendly park. So I uh, love the Indian stack here. I will have so many, so many variations of this Indian stack. Uh, I even love Cesar Hernandez uh, as a potential leadoff guy here. Maybe get some stolen bases. Uh, but J-Ram makes the cut. Uh, Lindor would be my favorite Indian to play. Carlos Santana is certainly in the mix. Franville Reyes, you guys might remember him from San Diego. Um, he's really, really affordable on Fandle at, at 2700 Absolutely interested in that. 44 on DraftKings. And Domingo Santana, you might remember him as a Milwaukee Brewer. He's got a little bit of hop. Of course, he does strike out a whole lot more. But uh, Danny Duffy, more of a contact pitcher right now. So uh, I love those contact uh, home run struggling guys against high K, high power guys. And we know Santana can get into one as well. So uh, not many Indians off my radar today, no matter what this lineup is. Hopefully, maybe we might get a shot at Lindor leading off. You know, historically, Lindor has been the leadoff guy for the Indians, uh, but maybe they want to look at Hernandez's uh, speed as a, a table setter for a guy like Lindor to be a little bit more consistent in that three spot. So a couple of different routes the Indians lineup could look. Uh, but I love the Indian stack. I'll definitely have some Bieber in the mix. 
if I wanted to uh, chase a, a solo shot off of Shane Bieber, he does give up a lot of hard contact, particularly to lefties of 48% in 2018 or 46.5% in 2019. And that accounted for a 1.6 home run per night to left-handed hitters last season. So a power lefty like Alex Gordon might steal one. Franchi Cordero, who has a 52.2% hard contact rate. Uh, against the righties, maybe he gets into one. Uh, but overall, it's definitely uh, a, a pitcher that I wouldn't uh, stand at the uh, a long line to to pick on. But on a you know big slate, if you're trying to chase that million dollar to first contest on Fanduel, maybe you got to get sneaky with one of these sleepers uh, who has a little bit of pop. Uh, also looking forward to see Salvador Perez uh, back behind the dish. Missed last season uh, after a uh, injury, so I want to see him and Duffy. Go back at it. No interest in Duffy for me. We'll have 0%. And like I said, the, the Royals bullpen was the gift I kept on giving last season. So we're going to keep playing uh, Indians. At least I am. <laughs> Let's move on to the next game. Cubs hosting the Milwaukee Brewers. Brandon Woodruff up against Kyle Hendricks. Brandon Woodruff has risen from an 11th round draft pick in 2014 to the Brewers minor league uh, pitcher of the year in 2016 to NL All-Star in 2019 to the Brewers' seventh different opening day starter in as many years. So quite a fun road for him in the last seven years. He'll be up against Kyle Hendricks, the soft-tossing uh, <laughs> ace, I guess you could say, for the Cubs here. He started Game 7 of the 2016 World Series for the Cubs, and he now earns his first career opening day nod. He posted a 3.46 ERA in 30 starts in 2019, but a 2.04 ERA in his last 14 starts at home. So he's pretty efficient uh, at home. It was a good little inning eater. The Cubs are one of those teams the last couple seasons where uh, a guy like Joe Madden, their manager, would make a lot of uh, quick switches, quick hooks, double switches, um, and there's two uh, uh, two things now that kind of shake that situation up. One, uh, Joe Madden is not the manager anymore. They they got David Ross, and two, the NL has the universal designated hitter spot. So you do wonder if a guy like Kyle Hendricks uh, gets deeper into games, maybe not early on, but as the season progresses, um, and that'll be something I'm watching. Brandon Woodruff is a way more interesting option for me than a guy like Hendricks. And I'll try and explain my point of view on both sides here. Woodruff, I'm a big fan of metrics. I love Sierra. I love XFIP. If I go to the pitcher metric chart here in my spreadsheet and I sort it from lowest Sierra in 2019 to highest, Woodruff is top four when it comes to uh, Sierra in 2019. And his XFIP was fine too, 3.66. Couple that with the fact that he had a 29.1% K rate uh, against righties and a near 29% K rate against lefties. There's a lot of potential strikeout upside. The Cubs are still one of those teams that maybe gets over-respected. Now, I'm not here to dog on the Cubs, but this is not that World Series team, right? They're still a team that, you know, last year struggled, uh, didn't make the cut, and at 7,700, you put these metrics on paper and you don't look at the names here for these Cubs players and you look at these K percentages and I, I I think I would gamble on that a little bit in tournament. So Brandon Woodruff, absolutely a guy that I'll be looking at uh, to play a little bit in my 150 uh, lineups on FanDuel and on DraftKings. So I do like that. Now when it comes to Kyle Hendricks, if you guys heard me last season, I mean, he's just one of those guys I'll never play. And it's because he has no velocity. And I know, like, all season long, I just, I just felt like I kept regretting it because his low velocity kept tempting me to pick on him with hitters. And he just never died, right? He has an average fastball of 86.9 miles an hour. Guys, there are pitchers in the league with change-ups faster than that. Uh, his curveball sits at 71.5 uh, miles an hour, and his change-up is 78.7 miles an hour. Like, his velocity just isn't there. And he's just one of those pitchers that manages to get it done. But with that, with those numbers, uh, and I and I love trusting advanced metrics. The metrics tell me it seems unsustainable long term. A 4.38 Sierra, a 4.26 xFIP. Swing and strike rate was okay, nothing fancy, nothing bad. You know, 10.3 percent. Ground ball rate was there, and the fly ball rate was was low. So it was a like, it was a guy that was just getting some soft tossing ground balls and. It, it, it frustrated me. <laughs> it did. Uh, he had a 1.18 home run per night to righties, so he bled a little bit more against righties. He's going against a uh, Brewers lineup that I think is going to be hit or miss a lot this season. Uh, it's going to just be one of those teams that I 
I, I stack a lot. I got Lorenzo Cain, solid two hole spot, a little bit of speed. I know he's at the end of his career. And I think if you look at this Brewers lineup and you're like, man, three years ago, four years ago, this lineup would be sick. Lorenzo Cain, Ryan Braun, Justin Smoke, Avisael Garcia. Like, there's some names here that a couple years ago, this lineup against a lefty would just be money in the bank. Uh, but I still think a couple of these guys, you know, may not be as good as they once were, but they'll be as good once as they ever were. And I definitely think um, you're going to see me play uh, Brewers in, in some sporadic stacks throughout the season. Christian Yelich is a matchup proof guy on DraftKings. He's 5,800 bucks. That makes a decision for me more than likely. It's just a hard price to go up and get. Uh, and that puts him as the most expensive guy on the slate above Mike Trout. So, if you pay for Christian Yelich, he has to uh, essentially be uh, a top five scorer on the slate to truly be satisfied. You know, double dunk potential, a guy that can give me 25 plus, maybe 20 plus uh, points as a hitter uh, for me to feel really happy. In cash games, you do you, uh, but that's a, whew, that's a price right there. Fando 4,400, still kind of a stretch, uh, whereas the rest of his team, if you wanted to maybe – uh, ride some coattails. The rest of the Brewers on FanDuel are pretty cheap. A lot of sub 3K guys. Only Keston Hira is over 3K. So I don't mind taking a couple stabs here in Brewers as some fillers here. I don't know if they would be one of my core stacks or anything like that. Uh, just because, you know, Hendricks has burned me so many times. But there's some fun names here. And there's also some names here that might uh, give us some stolen bases. Maybe Sogard, Lorenzo Kane, even Yellis can go. Um, and Ryan Braun. Has a really good history in Wrigley Park. So if you like park splits, you might look for him to keep that trend alive. I don't foresee either of these teams being a core stack for me. Implied run total for the Brewers at 4.1. The Cubs at 4.5. Uh, but certainly I could see Cherry picking here. And I could definitely see myself with a little bit of Brandon Woodruff as a SP2 option on uh, DraftKings. I don't mind that at all. We're going to keep the party rolling let's go to boston i think boston's going to be a pretty popular team to stack today and for good reason tommy malone, tommy malone taking the bump for the orioles uh they initially had john means as the opening day starter uh but he's not able to pitch because of arm fatigue and that's going to open up malone who's going to get the call for what will be the first opening day start of his career he'll be up against nathan eovaldi for the first time in his career He'll be starting uh, an opening day for a team. In nine career starts against the Orioles, Eovaldi's 3-1 with a 5.62 ERA. He's 5-2 with a 4.81 ERA. Lifetime at Fenway. Eovaldi, of course, uh, a recent, uh, I would say, beneficiary of Tommy John. Uh, has high velocity when he's on. And he does have strikeout potential when he's on. The Orioles are going to be one of the worst teams in baseball a lot of money's on them to be the worst team in baseball. I think between them and maybe like the Tigers, the Mariners, teams like that, uh, when teams go against the Orioles, they're going to expect to win. Red Sox are in a weird stage, right? No Chris Sale. They traded away Mookie Betts. Um, are they rebuilding? Are they tanking? Uh, lineup looks kind of funky. Uh, I, I think a lot will be remain to be seen past this Orioles series. But early on, we know Tommy Malone, not somebody to uh, be overly – uh, fearful of and if you look at his last two seasons against righties when it comes to xfip 4.42 xfip in 2018 against righties 5.12 last season against righties with an insanely high home run per nine on any projection system in the world you're gonna see jd martinez plugged and played as one of the best on paper plays and i can't argue with that jd martinez perennial lefty masher batting 370 one against lefty that's so insane that's not normal slugging 739 like this is actually insane numbers um so you're going to see him at the top of most bomb detector uh prediction prediction algorithms stuff like that As a matter of fact if we go look at my bomb detector i'm sure he's up there as well he's listed as number two between jd Mar or, or behind um fernando tati so jd martinez is going to be one of your premier options today 3900 on fanduel Probably a little bit too cheap considering we've already seen quite a few guys more expensive than him. And under 5K on DraftKings, I mean, sure. Uh, I, I don't think I would enter a cash game today without J.D. Martinez. Matchup's too pure. 
Park is a plus. If he's in the two spot against the Orioles, no matter who's pitching for them, uh, I'm, I'm in. With that said, uh, everyone's in, uh, in play for the Red Sox. Orioles limped into this season with one of the worst bullpens in baseball last season. Now, I do want to say that I do think the Orioles do have a couple of solid arms in their bullpen. Guys like Michael Givens. Um, who else is do I have in this uh, bullpen chart? Let me pull up the Orioles. Uh, Orioles. By the way, if you guys want this bullpen chart, uh, it is all the way in the back of the uh, VIP spreadsheet. Uh, Michael Givens isn't uh, the worst. We've got... I feel like they had another pickup. Man. No, I guess it's just Michael Givens that I would be overly... Um, not overly, but a little bit respectful of. So, Red Sox stack is in full play. Red Sox have an implied run total of 6.1. Uh, probably the highest on the slate by the time lock is. Probably, probably the highest on the slate right now. Uh, so, you're going to see the Red Sox is one of your trendier stacks. Uh, uh, and I don't believe that you have to stop with just righties against Tommy Malone. A 2.53 home run per nine last year against lefties. Um, guys, every, Ben Intendi, Rafael Devers, like these, these are all guys perfectly fine. You really couldn't go wrong uh, with anyone on this Red Sox team projection-wise against Tommy Malone. And they're likely going to be one of your cash game uh, stacks, if not the cash game stack. So look for them and then use that ownership uh, to your leverage or, your, or, your, or however you want to play uh, in tournaments. Like I said, these contests that have a million dollars to first on, on, on FanDuel, if it filled, it would have 1.1 million entries. Now, last time I looked, it had less than 15% uh, entries filled. So it might it might only get to 50%. Um, but if, if J.D. Martinez reaches like a 25 to 30% ownership rate, you might think about fading him in, in you know mass field tournaments just to have a little bit of leverage like that uh, against the rest of the field because um, it's baseball, right? 70% of the time, you're going to be out. <laughs> so there's at least that much variance uh, uh, to, to justify going the other way on J.D. Martinez. But in, in small entry, single entry, and cash games, J.D. Martinez would probably be a, a core click, one of the first names, if not the first name I click into a, a safest lineup I could create. Uh, Eovaldi. Is Eovaldi playable? I think he is. Last season, a 23.3% K rate to lefties. However, his XFIP through the roof, his home run per nine through the roof, and then against righties, a 23.1% K rate. Uh, again, struggling with a high average and a high X, but I, I, I don't know that Eovaldi at the end of the day cracks my player pool. But, I mean, he's he's going to be one of the larger favorites on the slate, and it's the Orioles. You look at this Orioles team, I mean, they have no power at all. They have Austin Hayes, who slugged over 800 and whatever sample size he had rocking with. Rest of the team against righties last season – was slugging well under 440. So I, I'm i not too scared of that. They don't have a lot of high K rate guys, but uh, you can make a case here, right? For a cheap win, a couple of strikeouts here, maybe a strikeout per inning. I don't think it's crazy. Am I projecting a high ceiling game here? I don't know. Based on the fact that he's a high velocity guy and we want to get that arm stretched out, you know, maybe his, 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 uh, his road to 90 to 100 pitches is going to be a little bit longer. If you guys watched the Dodgers game last night, uh, Dustin May, great example. He throws 99, 100 miles an hour. I mean, those guys take a little bit longer to stretch out just because of how much power is in their throw. So I, I don't know that Eovaldi would make my final cut on an 11-game slate, but if this was like a five-game slate, I think I think he would be in the mix for me. No Tommy Malone. <laughs> you, you guys might be shocked on that one. No Tommy Malone for me. Uh, Red Sox stack likely to be pretty trendy. Let's keep it moving. Let's move on to, was this the Rangers game? Easy. All right. Rockies at the Rangers. Pitching for the Rockies. Herman Marquez is going to make his first opening day start in his first regular season appearance against the Rangers at their new, new ball, uh, ballpark, English. Last season, Marquez went 7-3 and three with a 3.67 ERA and 15 road starts, and he finished with 175 total strikeouts and 174 innings. He'll be up against Lance Lynn. Lynn's making his first career opening day start. It'll also be his first start against the Rockies since 2017. He's 2-2 two and two with a 2.76 ERA and a 1.16 whip against Colorado over seven starts. Uh, if you guys are a little bit newer to DFS, Colorado Rockies, uh, when it comes to their pitching or, or pitching stats against them, 
over X amount of sample size. We always take that with a grain of salt because they do play in Coors Field, the most hitter-friendly park in baseball, uh, and it's a literal different altitude, a different element, different atmosphere. Uh, so it's not the same as uh, more general stats are. So when I look at Herman Marquez, you might see uh, on paper an elevated ERA from last season. But when you split that in half to his road starts, it gets a little bit better. And we'll do that. Let's use fan graphs here to kind of tell the story. Let's go Herman Marquez and pull up his player card. If you guys are not users of fan graphs, I definitely recommend getting acclimated with this site and learning how to drive around, navigate a little bit when you need some deeper answers on individual uh, players. So we go to Marquez's player card. We're going to go to splits, and we're going to see how he performs on the road. Last season on the road, 100.2 innings of sample size. That aforementioned 3.67 ERA with just a 212 batting average allowed, just a 273 Woba allowed, and 91 strikeouts in those 100 innings. So pretty good numbers when it comes to average allowed um, strikeouts. You'd like to see closer to a strikeout per inning. Uh, but there's enough there to say, hey, this guy's not a terrible pitcher. The Rangers are changing ballparks from Globe Life, which was an outdoor hot stadium. The new stadium, maybe we see how it plays out a little bit more, but it does have a roof. So uh, at the worst, it wouldn't be as hot as Globe Life was. And a lot of people have suspected that it's going to be much more pitcher friendly, uh, which is why you know the Rangers maybe go out and get guys like Corey Kluber Um to kind of take advantage of, of the new area. Uh, let's go look at more road splits here. So on the road last season, 8.14 K per nine. That's actually funny. He had a higher K per nine on the road than in uh, Coors Field. And his home run per nine was at 1.43, 23.3% K rate, a very low walk rate, uh, and a sub one whip with a 236 BABIP. So his BABIP, a little bit on the lucky side, uh, but there's still some underlying metrics that make me like um, taking Herman Marquez. Uh, whenever I can on the road. I think uh, 8,200 on Fandle, I'm a little bit intrigued. I like the Rangers overall as a uh, offense. I think they got some scary pop, some scary power. Uh, so I wouldn't you know, hit that lock button on Marquez. But I think in 150 lineups, Marquez makes my player pool uh, just because of uh, what I know is upside to be on the road in the past. And it can give me a safe, uh, safe return uh, point-wise. The Rockies are slight underdogs here, implied run total 4.1, and the Rangers have an implied run total of 4.5. Lance Lynn on the bump here, 8,900. So he's been solid when it comes to like ERA and, uh, and eating uh, innings. Last season, a 35.7% K rate against righties. The season prior, 28.6%. Um, this Rockies lineup projects super lefty heavy with just Trevor Story and Nolan Arenado as the righties. And both those guys are uh, high power, uh, decent hit for average guys. So it's not a matchup that I'm sh really in love with targeting Lance Lynn here. And also, um, they do have a change at catcher. I think last year they had a little bit more Jeff Mathis all the way around. And he's one of the, the best pitch framers. So Lance Lynn probably off the table for me. But if you told me uh, you wanted to play a pitcher with these numbers against you know the Rockies on the road, I wouldn't talk to you too long, but if it if that lineup came out with seven lefties, and we're looking at Lance Lynn's xFIP against lefties the last two seasons, uh, you know I would just say good luck. I don't see myself playing Lance Lynn here. Uh, I talked about how um, Kyle Hendricks doesn't have much velocity behind his pitches. I like guys with velo. Lance Lynn doesn't have a whole lot of pitches. <laughs> he throws a fastball, and then when he's done throwing a fastball, he'll throw some more fastballs. Seventy-one point four percent fastball rate last season, or last yeah last season. Ninety-four point two uh, average miles an hour on that pitch. I, when hitters can pretty much know what's coming, like I like their chances a little bit more. So a, a couple of Rockies here are going to project pretty well for me. I love David Dahl. On both sides, if he does lead off here at 2,900 on FanDuel, I mean, how does that not crack your player pool, you know? So many at-bats here. Great matchup on paper. It's it's not something that's going to break your bank. I think the guy that crushes me is Charlie Blackman. On DraftKings, he's 5,500. That puts him as the fourth highest priced guy. This isn't Coors. Not to say the Blackman isn't good, but like, like, it's like you got course pricing for this matchup. So I'm a little bit 
less than excited to play a guy like Charlie Blackman. Um, Aaron Donald is a guy you can play anywhere. I like his Fanduel price uh, a little bit more. Uh, Trevor Story, probably a, a guy I'd be worried about as one of the strikeout victims here. Twenty six point seven percent K rate against righties. Lynn, of course, does have a good K rate against righties. Um, but I think all of the top four here for the Rockies would be in play, just it, price aside. Like if you're just considering matchup. But David Dahl, if he leads off at 2,900 on Fanduel, he's probably going to be one of my more preferred options. And then I probably don't mess too much with the bottom half of that order. Maybe you look at a guy like Daniel Murphy for a couple of hits, and um, you know dealing with some injuries the last season or so. Uh, on the Ranger side, if I did not want to play. Herman Marquez, or if I wanted to hedge a little bit, Marquez does have a 1.61 home run per nine to lefties. <clears throat> and if we isolate that a little bit more for the road, he had a 1.4 home run per nine on the road last year to lefties. So it wasn't like a core specific problem. So guys like Joey Gallo, 3,500 on Fandle. I mean, this is a double dong type of guy, a massive, massive power. And then you look at guys that, you know, maybe slip in as a uh, sneaky bomb, a guy like Willie Calhoun, Danny Santana maybe. But I think Joey Gallo is one of my favorite one-offs throughout the season just because he has that innate ability to just <laughs> hit a baseball to a different planet. Um, so I like Joey Gallo metrically. I'm curious to see how he does in the uh, bomb detector here. Can't be too far down. <clears throat> Gallo has a 3.92 uh, rating in the bomb detector with four is kind of like the magic number. So he's not that far from looking really good in the bomb detector. So I like I like Joey Gallo as a one-off from the Rangers. Again, mediocre um, projected run total. So I'll probably cherry pick here. I'm probably not over committing to stacks, but give me Dahl, run it back with some Gallo. I like that start. And then uh, maybe a dab of Herman Marquez. Uh, let's move on to the next game here. We're going to go check out the White Sox hosting the Minnesota Twins. This game is going to be fun to watch. Uh, when I first looked at this slate, I was like, this could be the most unpredictable, unpredictable game ever because <laughs> it could go so many ways. We got two really talented offenses. The Twins offense is f stacked, loaded. These guys were home run hitting kings last season. And then the White Sox lineup is so young and so powerful, so talented that they can create problems for anybody on any given day. <coughs> Man, haven't done these uh, videos in forever. I'm losing my voice. And Lucas Cialito versus Ho Jose Barrios make the situation that that much more uh, volatile. You got um, – when we look at the Sierras from lowest to highest last season, Giolito had the third lowest Sierra on this slate. And Jose Barrios is at a 4.28 overall Sierra. So his metrics say maybe he's a little bit more luckier here. Um, but nonetheless, he has good strikeout stuff. Um, Barrios, that is. He has been a guy that struggles a little bit more on the road, a 4.67 x trip in 18 a 4.3 x in, in 19, but he's going to carry respect in every game that he plays. So this becomes one of those games where if you're brave enough to dedicate some stacks to both offenses, it could pay off in those big field tournaments because uh, both offenses are talented enough to get to just about any pitcher. Uh, and then uh, likewise, you might be too scared to play these pitchers against these offenses and maybe get a little lucky there. I don't really want to pick on this Twins lineup, but the metrics tell me Giolito is better here. 31.5% K rate last year to lefties, 33.2% K rate to righties. Did have some power issue because he throws strikes, a 1.33 home run per nine to righties last season. So it's definitely a recipe for um, disaster. Uh, but, man, this is definitely like a stick of dynamite, and it can go either way. And I think if I'm playing mass field tournaments where the general player is a little bit more fearful to make that – uh, dis decision, you know, players are being indecisive where they end up just full fading this game because they don't know what's going to happen. Play, play some, some, some hedge, play some leverages, play a little bit of Giolito, play a little bit of twin stacks, uh, maybe play some White Sox stacks and play a little bit of Barrios. Uh, I think you can make a stronger case to, to fade Barrios here based on his, you know, his road X FIP and his low swing and strike rate last season, stuff like that. 
Uh, but generally speaking, I still think, you know, nobody would be that surprised if Barrios went out there and had a pretty strong game. Um, Vegas wise, we got a 4.3 implied run total for the Twins, which is the same as the White Sox. So we're dealing with ourselves a, a, a pick em. Um, all the bats make a lot of sense. Uh, the Twins stack is going to be a stack that I probably lean on a lot this season. Uh, and it, they might become one of those teams where I don't really care who is pitching against them, you know? Like, they're just that talented. They bleed through a starting pitcher. They get to a, a, a bullpen. And they just got names that can make stuff happen. So Kepler, Jorge Polanco, Nelson Cruz, they added Josh Donaldson, Eddie Rosario. I mean, this lineup is dirty. So uh, Twins just might be one of those stacked by default teams every slate, and I think this would be a good chance to uh, get on that. Uh, White Sox are going to be one of the more Cinderella uh, hype teams uh, that really haven't done anything yet, but there's a lot of hope uh, for the names that they have. Tim Anderson's a fun to root for guy. Notorious for his bat flipping, Yohan Makata, top prospect in baseball. Uh, guys like Jose Abreu has been so consistent. Yasmani Grandal has been floating, but he's been a really solid hand, uh, both offensively and defensively. Edwin Encarnacion was one of the uh, top home run guys for much of last season. Helped the Yankees make a deep push in the playoffs. Eloy Jimenez, another top prospect here. Luis Robert, another top prospect. So they have a lot of prospects here uh, with a nice mix of veteran uh, present so there's a lot of hype on the White Sox as a Cinderella story uh, and I'm not for or against it <laughs> so I'm gonna be a little bit of a, a cop out here and just kind of uh, play both sides of it in mass field tournaments and then in like single entry or cash games I probably don't lock in to one guy or the other let's move on to the next game here Pirates up against the Cardinals show Musgrove taking on Jack Flaherty Musgrove it's gonna make his first opening day start of his career to begin his fifth MLB season after leading the Bucks in innings and strikeouts in 2019, Musgrove believes he's improved his mechanics and pitch usage under new pitching coach Oster, uh, Oscar Marin. Jack Flaherty, the budding ace, makes his first opening day start at 24 years old, making him the youngest Cardinals pitcher to start opening day since Joe McGrain in 1989. Flaherty looks to continue his success from last season where he had a 2.75 ERA in 33 starts. Metrics love Jack Flaherty. A 2.75 overall ERA last season. A 3.68 Sierra. A 3.64 XFIP. And a beautiful, beautiful 13.8% swing and strike rate. We like to see that in a sub one whip. So uh, much like the Twins might be one of those teams I stack against anyone. Jack Flaherty is probably one of those guys I take chances on against just about any team. And at 9K on DraftKings, he's one of those guys, if he gets me to 20 points, I'm happy. The Pirates are not a high strikeout team, so there's a little bit of devil's advocate there. But the metrics kind of suggest that maybe he could skill his way past that. Brian Reynolds with 21.9% K rate. Colin Moran, 20% K rate. Guillermo Heredia, 21.3% K rate. And Jacob Stallings, a near 21% K rate. Those are your only guys that have been striking out 1-4 and four or better against righties. Uh, but like I said, you might expect Flaherty to skill his way uh, to a couple strikeouts against some of these other guys. I will say there's a little bit of a leak in issues uh, home run wise against uh, lefties. Last season, a 1.29 home run per nine against left handed hitting with a 42.5% hard contact rate. So if he's not striking out lefties, he does allow the propensity for a hard hit ball to get by. And a guy like Josh Bell could be. Um, uh, uh, maybe, I don't want to say sneaky, but he could be a sneaky one-off here. 3,400 on FanDuel, 44 on DraftKings. If he's batting near that cleanup spot, we know he has a lot of power and there was a lot of, um, a lot of momentum behind him to the first half of last season where he just looked like he was on pace to hit a million home runs, win the home run derby. He has a 40.1% hard contact rate last two years against righties. Good spot for him. Any, any low K lefty here with a little bit of pop against Flaherty has a chip in a chair. Uh, to hit a home run, even Brian Reynolds, even though he strikes out over twenty percent, so I don't like I, I don't mind uh, taking a stab at Josh Bell here. Uh, overall, the Pirates lineup has a pretty decent hit for average. If you look at this projected one through six, uh, all but Jose Ozuna have a two eighty and above batting average against righties. So it's probably not going to be an easy task for Jack Flaherty. And if his you know pitch cap is super limited. Um, you know, maybe maybe this gets becomes a little tougher uh, adventure. But at 9K, I think the risk reward is there for for me on Flaherty. Flaherty right now is a 
minus 186 favorite. The Cardinals have a 4.7 implied run total. The Pirates, 3.4. And anybody on the Pirates sticking out to me? Probably not, though Musgrove does have uh, some lefty issues. A 270-plus average allowed to left-handed hitting the last two seasons. And last year, he had a 1.25 home run per nine. Again, home park being PNC. Not that Bush Stadium's a, a hitter's park or anything like that. But you wonder if uh, that home run per nine would be a little bit more in a more neutral park. A 37.5% hard contact rate against left-handed hitting. Who might profile to benefit in uh, metrics like that? Mm. Mar Matt Carpenter had a really unlucky first half last season. Still maintains a over 45% hard contact rate against righties the last two seasons. So maybe he can send one over the wall. That's probably the first guy I look at as Carp there. 2,500 on FanDuel on Carpenter seems a little bit a little bit light. Uh, I probably don't get to any Joe Musgrove, but if you told me that his price in this Bush Stadium Park was enough for you to accept 15 to 20 DraftKings points, I don't think you're that crazy to chase that. I do feel like you know it doesn't make me feel warm and fuzzy, but I can see the price kind of justifying – uh, making a lineup that stacks you guys like J.D. Martinez and and maybe you want to take a shot at Charlie Blackman. You know what I'm saying? Guys like Mike Trout, guys like that. Uh, so I don't think that's a crazy approach if you wanted to run some lineups like that. But if I had to make like a, a five to six player pool for pitching, I don't think Joe Musgrove cracks cracks that pool for me. But I could, I could understand the, the argument there. Flaherty does crack it on DraftKings. Remains to be seen if I'll get to him on FanDuel. We'll see if the, if I have enough cheapies on FanDuel, I can get a little bit safer with pitching. Yesterday it was tough on FanDuel because we weren't we weren't getting any discounts on on a lot of guys. Let's move on to the next game here: Mariners at the Astros. Cupcake start here for the Astros and Justin Verlander. Verlander won the Cy Young Award last season. He's going to make his twelfth career opening day start. And 34 starts in 2019, he went 21-6 with a 2.58 ERA, 300 strikeouts, and a 0 0.8 whip in 223 innings. Is that good? Well, it's not bad. He'll be up against Marco Gonzalez, the lefty. He's going to get his second career opening day start, but he faces a tough matchup. 28-year-old lefty's 0-4 with a 7.36 ERA in seven games, six starts against Houston. Wonder why. <laughs> including 0-2 with a 5.66 ERA and four starts against the AOS champs last season. So I'm not going to be one of those touts that, uh, you know what, F it. I have screw the Astros. <laughs> um, yeah, good spot for Astros writings here uh, and a good spot for Justin Verlander. Now, Verlander is going to be the ultimate decision uh, to make at over 11K on both sites. It's going to be a big-time favorite. Is a minus 298 right now that's the largest favorite on the slate i believe uh even though the the uh red sox have a higher implied run total uh he, he's he's the largest favorite so very very low range of outcomes here for verlander to not get the win uh but like i said earlier they probably have him on ice here right it's a short season you don't want to blow your guy out against the mariners early on so we'll see if he's on he's on and if you're playing them, you're just trying to get maybe you know a quality start, six innings, a win, and you'd love to get probably 10 strikeouts at this price, right? So he's certainly in the pool. I'm very curious to see what his ownership projection will look like in the morning, and we'll work from there. Marco Gonzalez, no thank you. Uh, 5,900 on DraftKings. If you guys are not familiar with him, Marco Gonzalez, uh, a contact pitcher, has been more reverse splits than anything the last – couple of years a 302 average to lefties last season with a 1.38 home run per nine not a lot of lefties I, I would run from um josh reddick would probably be a curious click if you went off of reverse splits maybe michael brantley another one but outside of that i mean uh, there's no one off limits here for the astros george springer altuve bregman like these guys are all on paper talented <laughs> they won't have the benefit of trash cans maybe this season but who knows if they've come up with another concoction um no mariners hitters for me uh verlander does have the propensity to give up some homers a 1.58 home run per nine last season to righties 40 and a half percent hard contact rate to both sides of the plate so maybe a guy like daniel vogelbach or somebody like that could sneak through with a big 
blast, but could never see myself stacking Mariners here, and it would be even hard to add a couple of one-offs to the player pool. But Vogelbach is kind of a power guy that maybe gets into one, you know? Uh, all the Astros in play. Let's move on to the next game. Diamondbacks at the Padres. Oof, I've been looking for this one. Uh, we're going to see the debut of Madison Bumgarner with the Diamondbacks. He has made five opening day starts for the Giants, including one against the Padres last year. Uh, Diamondbacks signed him to a five-year, $85 million free agent deal this past winter to replace Zach Grinke at the top of the rotation. He'll be up against Chris Paddock. Paddock called his duel with the D-backs ace Madison Bumgarner, quote, a Cowboys showdown. It will be Paddock's first opening day start. After a series of restrictions and workload limitations in 2019, he's going to be turned loose in 2020. Chris Paddock is a guy that projects extremely well. Uh, while the Sierra and XFIP has some room for improvement, if you want him to be a pure true ace, uh, you saw it in the swing and strike rate. You saw it in the whip. There is a, a, a real good pitcher in Chris Paddock, and I think this price is going to be higher going forward. 8900 on FanDuel, 8600 on DraftKings. I'm a buyer. I really am. Uh, the D-backs are not a team that project as a high K team. Just Christian Walker, Cole Calhoun, Jake Lamb have an over 21% K rate against uh, right-handed pitchers. Eduardo Escobar, maybe a 1-5. in five. Uh, Carson Kelly, a 1-5. in five. But they don't also project with a lot of power. Uh, just Eduardo Escobar, David Peralta have over a 500 slugging. And there's a couple of middling averages. So I don't mind looking at a guy like Chris Paddock for maybe a shot at a quality star to win uh, and maybe a strikeout per inning. Now let's talk about Madison Bumgarner. Madison Bumgarner the last couple seasons has led baseball uh, generally in hard contact allowed, particularly to right-handed hitters. A 43.5% hard contact rate in 2018, a 45.5% hard contact rate in 2019. If you guys are not familiar with hard contact, that is the amount of times uh, an exit velocity of a batted ball exceeded 95 miles an hour. And uh, batted balls with an exit velocity of 95 miles or greater uh, an hour have an over 500 batting average. So uh, it's a great uh, tool to uh, maybe project hits, but also project power. Last season, a 1.47 home run per nine to right-handed hitters. Petco Park, not a hitter's park, but it's a little bit better than AT&T. Uh, and I do think Madison Bumgarner has been the beneficiary of the top pitcher's park in baseball, uh, maybe suppressing some stuff from last couple seasons. 4.5 x trip last year uh, against righties, a 4.56 the year prior. And on the road last season, a 4.91 x trip with a 286 average allowed. And his Sierra over 4 is x trip overall 4.31. So I think the Padres... Might be my favorite stack on the slate. And on FanDuel, too easy, man. It's too easy. 3300 for for Fernando Tatis on FanDuel. Will Myers is not somebody I'm running to. He does have a lot of historical home runs, but he doesn't have a high average. Manny Machado, Tommy Pham. Um, even maybe a... Uh, I'm going to say maybe a Aaron shot at like a Francisco Mejia. But I love this for this at least one through four. But, man, Tatis, Machado, fam, I love that three stack so much. And then Jerickson Profar actually bats 283 overall against uh, left-handed pitching. So maybe he's cheap enough to plug in. So I will love these top three Padres. If you go look at that hitter rating chart in uh, my spreadsheet, you'll find a lot of Padres at the top of the bomb detector. We got Fernando Tatis has the highest bomb rating in my projections on the slate. He's been hitting lefties with a lot of power. We got Will Myers up there. We got Manny Machado up there. So there's a lot of potential power being projected uh, just based on the hard contact allowed by Mad Bum versus the hard contact gained by the Padres. Will Myers, uh, sneaky, 48.5% hard contact rate uh, against lefties when he does make contact past that 30.6% K rate. Uh, so I love those. At least those threes for the Padres will probably be in a lot of my lineups. Like those might be three of my highest home players. And that's Tatis, Machado, Tommy Pham. Uh, Mad Bum, like, uh, so Mad Bum's in a position where I wouldn't, if you played Mad Bum, I'm not going to talk you off of him, right? I do think he has a household name. It's probably cheap enough for him to, uh, even ground ball his way through some, some innings here. And, you know, he's, he's, he's pitched in Petco quite a bit. He knows, he knows his way around the mound up there. So I wouldn't call you crazy for that. I don't know that he's going to crack my pool. 
but I don't think you're insane to to have a couple dabs of Madison Bumgarner in your lineups. But I do love me a couple of Padres, and I also have a, a little bit of Chris Paddock. I think if Chris Paddock's under 9K on either site going forward until, like, proven one way or the other, I'm going to take some shots at him. Uh, Paddock did have some power struggles to both sides of the plate last year, an over 40% hard contact rate. Uh, guys like Cattell Marte, I mean, these guys were getting MVP votes. Starling Marte, uh, Eduardo Escobar, David Peralta. That one through four, I, I don't think you're crazy to take a couple shots in that. I do think that the Padres bullpen uh, is plus. Uh, if we go look at some of the names from uh, lingering from last season. Let's see, Padres. We know we got Kirby Yates, uh, one of the best closers uh, in the league, 2.25 XFIP. Uh, who else we got here? We got Matt Strong. Man, I don't know. I'm kind of curious if we bridge the gap here. Hmm. All right. I'm just curious to see what that looked like. Um, but, yeah, give me a little bit of Chris Paddock. Uh, what was the Vegas odds here? 132 favorite is uh, are the Padres. Um, can I get – I'm trying to think how much percentage I would have Chris Paddock. I, I, I probably cap him at 10% in 150 lineups. I'd have some. Like, he's worth having. And I love those three Padres. All right, only a couple games left. We got the Giants at the Dodgers. Don't know who's going to pitch for the Giants yet as of this second. It's about 2 in the morning my time. But I do have Ross Stripling listed as the starter here for the Dodgers. Uh, in February, he thought he was traded. In March, he was headed to the bullpen. Uh, but Stripling begins the season replacing David Price in the rotation. Two seasons removed from an all-star appearance. So... Uh, don't know who they're going to go against. This is a talented Dodgers team. Uh, they kind of slow rolled yesterday to six plus runs uh, against Cueto. Cueto had a couple of uh, uh, innings that were a little bit more babapy, but then they uh, turned it on. And Enrique Hernandez, Kike Hernandez, MVP of the game easily. Uh, late home run. I think he had five or six RBIs too. So big day for Enrique Hernandez. Guys like Max Muncy, Mookie Betts, Cody Bellinger maybe underperformed. Mookie did get a single. Um, Cody Bellinger did have seven DraftKings points, but not what you expected. Uh, but, I'm, I mean, Dodgers are none of those teams. I almost don't care who's going to be pitching against them. We're going to stack Dodgers every night just because they always have that blow-up potential. It's going to be no different tonight. Uh, we did learn that Gabe Kepler is going to be one of those guys that goes to the bullpen. And he went to the bullpen early and often last night. Despite the three minimum rule, um, we saw guys like Drew Smiley, who we'll probably see again tonight. Um, actually, I, there's a good chance two or three of those guys that came out the pen last night might play tonight, um, except that kid that walked <laughs> walked everyone. But I think Drew Smiley might catch uh, another appearance tonight. And if that happens, maybe it lines up to where he sees Kike Hernandez or A.J. Pollock again. He might get a sneaky bullpen bomb. Uh, Stripling is 6,600 on FanDuel. I think that's probably going to be too cheap as a 263 favorite uh, to not take some shots on him, right? Uh, just because if he did fall into a win, you almost don't even need the quality start. If he did fall into a win, a couple strikeouts, um, he'd be looking good. This Giants team is not a super high strikeout team. And then yesterday, uh, Dustin May throwing 99, 100 was not really blowing a lot by. And it was a lot of bab up uh, guys reaching. We saw a couple bunts. Uh, infield single stuff like that, uh, but I think at 6,600, the the opportunity cost, the risk reward, probably still worth it uh, to have a couple of shares of Ross Stripling late, and that would unlock your lineups to some of those high end uh, big bats, those JD Martinez lineups, those Mike Trout stuff like that, and even Dodger stacks. So uh, definitely would have some Stripling. AK on DraftKings, you know, the decision's a little bit blurrier. Maybe I put him in, cap him at five percent, see what happens. Um, but I definitely think on Fandle, uh, it would be kind of hard to not have uh, at least some roster stripling, if not a, a decent chunk in some bat-heavy lineups. Uh, but typically, I don't like to recommend going bat-heavy on big slates because we know there's going to be pitchers that have great games. Um, but the, the caveat there is a lot of pitchers have only thrown 80-ish pitches in their last scrimmage. So it's a weird time we're living in. We got one game left on the docket. Remind you guys – if you guys want access to this spreadsheet for your own research, you can get it with a premium subscription uh, to me. <laughs> Just go to twitter.com 
slash Gundacker Sports. Send me a DM. Right now it's running 25 bucks for a week, 80 bucks for the month, 300 bucks if you want to lock in for the rest of the year. This is going to include 24-7 Discord access, uh, pre-lock voice chats, and uh, disc, uh, uh, spreadsheet access. And it's not just for baseball. Next week when basketball is back, we'll have coverage for that. Uh, like I said, last night they crushed it on NASCAR and NFL, hopefully in about a month uh, Ish, a month and a week or two uh, as well. So hopefully we'll have all those sports going, and um, this these subscriptions will cover access to all of that. So we'll have some fun. Come join that Discord, man. That Discord is really, really where it's at. All right, one game left on the docket. It's your main event. It's the Angels at the Athletics. Uh, Frankie Montes returning for the Athletics. He's going to make his first opening day start as the A's take on the Angels. Uh, Montes is coming off a breakout 2019 in which he went 9-2 and with a 2.63 ERA over 16 starts. Uh, Andrew Heaney, the lefty, starting for the Angels. He's the longest tenured Angels starter on this staff. He's set to get his first opening day start. He struck out 118 batters in 95 and a third innings last year, but he gave up 20 homers and posted a 4.91 ERA. Montes was a uh, that the uh, velo guy they got popped for PEDs too. So I I don't think the PEDs was something we can directly link to his velocity, uh, but it is something to, to at least be uh, cognitive of. Angels not a team I ever really like to pitch against, and I think this Angels lineup as is could be really dangerous and really fun to stack going forward. Maybe Montes is going to be tempting fate here if we we roll out those late Angel stacks in a real big pitchers park, but. I mean, Mike Trout, Shohei Otani, a healthy Justin Upton, Tommy LaStella. There's a couple fun names to put on some lineups here uh, as some late-night hammers. And Mike Trout's always a guy that gets uh, ownership as a late-night hammer. Trout coming in at 5700 bucks, though. You always got to pay up for him. You know what you're going to get. <laughs> Decisions in your hand. Um, the Athletics here against Andrew Heaney. Heaney, high K rate against lefties and righties last season. Over a 27% to lefties and a 29.3% to righties. But the power, man, the power is a problem. Uh, so guys that profile pretty well, the high slugging guys, the 480-plus slugging, Marcus Simeon, Ramon Laureano, Matt Chapman, all guys with 40-ish to plus percent hard contact rates. So definitely some home run potential there. Maybe we look at the history here, maybe some BVP. Uh, let's see if we can find uh, Andrew Heaney. He'd be at the top, tippy top, right? Uh, we have one homer by Laureano, one by Chapman, Mark Canna. So uh, no high averages, but not a deep sample size to really even uh, mention much. Uh, uh, Steven Piscotti, I don't mind that either. So this is going to be a game that probably doesn't project as anything fancy, high scoring. we got an implied run total for the Athletics at 4.7. Angels at 3.9. 4.7 is not bad uh, for the Athletics. So maybe if you wanted to, to piece together a couple of uh, Samian, Chapman, you know, all those guys would make the player pool. Um, Chris Davis, you know, 2,700 on Fanduel. We know his potential. We know his pop. Uh, fizzled out last year, kind of. But I wouldn't talk you off him if you think he's a cheap shot at a late night bomb at 2,700. Uh, all bets are off once that bullpen <laughs> gets in the mix. Davis does have like over 500 slugging against lefties the last couple seasons. So uh, I probably don't end up on either pitcher. I think Frankie Montes would be a little bit more curious for me. Um, but there's enough un unknowns here and enough respect for the Angels lineup that I'll probably stay away from now. Uh, Mike Trout, Shohei Otani, uh, even Upton and LaStella are guys that I think I could four-piece me throw in David Fletcher with a high-average leadoff guy. That one through five could be a fun, um, or at least fun five guys to have in the player pool and then maybe a, a stack or two uh, of them in the mix. And let's take a look at that pitch report here. I always love looking at Mike Trout pitch reports. Uh, if you guys are unfamiliar with the Pitch Report, Pitch Report is a tool that I created that displays uh, hitters and pitchers, uh, pitches, pitch selection, and how they have performed against that pitch or how they've used that pitch graded on a linear scale with zero being the average and above being plus and minus uh, or below zero being minus. So Frankie Montz is going to throw 56.8% fastball, back that up with nearly a slider and one in four pitches. Mike Trout, a two-plus grade against both of those pitches. Good luck. Shohei Otani also a, a, a over a one grade against both of those pitches. So Otani and Trout both looking like uh, great options based on that information. And then Heaney, a 58% fastball user, backs that up with a slider. 
not really a lot of high slider grades here for the athletics. Just Sean Murphy, and I'd be almost certain that that's based on low sample size. So maybe something to be cognitive of. Um, yeah, anyway, that's your slate. That's what we're looking at. Uh, let's see if we can't put together a core of players um, on draft. So in like a single entry type of game, like I said, I think we want to start everything with like a J.D. Martinez, right? And on DraftKings, he is 4,800. Compared to the rest of the, the slate right now, J.D. Martinez barely being a top 10. If it, is he even top 10? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. J.D. Martinez is not even a top 10 price guy. He probably becomes my favorite. Like uh, That's too hard to pass up. So we had J.D. Martinez in the mix. We're looking for some middling performances, high floor, decent shot at ceiling guys. Um, I probably would want, hmm, probably, I still think Stripling's a little too cheap. I like the idea of Woodruff. Eovaldi's really cheap. I want to give you guys at least one pitcher to play with. And I don't want it to be, like, obvious, right? Verlander's too easy. Who did I say was almost 300 favorite? Ross Stripling? Man, that's hard to look away from. It really is. All right, let's put Stripling in there at 8K. Um, I see uh, Jeff Samarja projected to start for the Giants, according to DraftKings. So let me just put him in the spreadsheet and see if that would open up anything. Samarja. Anyway, well, that loads. So let's put Stripling in there just because he's a high favorite. Good shot to win. If we can get if we can get 18 to 20 out of Stripling on a safe end, I'll take that. Uh, J.D. Martinez, 4,800. And it leaves us 46.6 per. Uh, I, I think we want Tatis as well. Tatis is breaking my chart, so we'll put Tatis at our shortstop spot. Uh, what else do we do here? Let's go to the hitter rating chart. Let's go look at some high G ratings. Jordan Luplo is up there. Oh, probably. Oh, man, Lindor. We can't have Lindor and Tatis, right? Neither one of them are dual position. I have to choose between the two, and that might be your, um, that might be your your slate winning decision at least on short, short um short entry contest, right? Uh, let's see, Ch -ch -ch -ch. Tatis, JD Martinez, Bregman's just fifty three. No, Machado, probably Machado. Machado third base that in it gives me four we can get one more five guys to start with is there any sneaky catchers they're a little bit cheaper it doesn't look like it salvador perez is down there but i want to pick on him specifically maybe sean murphy based on a couple of the short sample size fakeness stats that we've seen josh bell at 44 i think he's a fun shot in the dark Looking for someone around the 4K range. That way you guys could still play. I'll tell you what. If Jeff Samar just started, I'd probably go 4 or 5 on Max Muncy. Probably. He made some decent contact last night. He actually flew out to the warning track last night. Late last night. Center field. So, finds his swing there. He could be in, in business here. Those are five guys I'd, I'd mess with uh, to start a lineup. Um, and then, like I said, it'd be a little tougher to go get one of those middling pitchers like a Flaherty, but you're still left with 37.50, completely punt catching. We're fine. And then on Fanduel, I think it's it's so easy to go down there and just play Ross Stripling and load up on bats, and maybe that's something I would do in a uh, probably a tournament. I would want a safer four with my pitchers. Nola's nine nine. How much was Nola on DraftKings? 9-1. Man, Nola might be the play for me here. Yeah, I probably want to get some Nola as well. All right, let me put Nola in there for now. And then, like I said, I want J.D. Martinez. I think J.D. Martinez, uh, I know, Fandle, J.D. Martinez, uh, Fernando Tatis, and I would love to get Lindor part of that core. I, I mean, that's just huge three right there. It leaves me 28, 20 per. So I got to get way more creative, and I might go... Over here to look for some of the cheaper names. I got Luplo at 22. 
for Cleveland if he does crack that lineup. Uh, all wait, what? Jordan Lopuelo, yeah. Put him in there. That'll push me to twenty nine. So almost three K per. So I kind of like that as a starting point, a little skeleton, and we move on from there. Uh, anyway, that's my first look at this slate. It is the night before. Uh, I do have another video uploading uh, tonight as well. If you guys are new to uh, MLB on FanDuel, if you're looking for information on how to run 150 lineups in terms of the transferring information on CSVs, uh, I have an instructional video on how to do that. So look out for that. Otherwise, hit me up on Twitter, twitter.com slash Gundacker Sports. Uh, uh, DMs are open if you're trying to get access to the spreadsheet, get part of the, the premium. I actually do list my player pool every night and a couple of optimal builds, stuff like that. So you're more than welcome to check that out, compare my notes to your notes, uh, and hopefully you go out there and win a bunch of money. Somebody tonight is going to win a million dollars from playing DFS. It might as well be you. Good luck out there. If I don't win it, I hope you win it. I love you guys. Good luck. God bless. Go win some money.